I've been co-founder of Play the Redwoods campaign, and currently I'm executive director of Circle of the Earth Grassroots Women Taking Action for a Sustainable Future. So we have been a tribe. We have been an amazing group of people who have come together in this community around something that's really important to us. And um, Matthew has asked me to talk about my past work rather than about the Oak Grove. And some of the interesting, how do I start? I, I, I guess I'll just um, go back to some of the work I was doing in Mendocino County. I originally from the East Coast. Actually, my first um, ever participation in anything that I call civic or political was the anti-apartheid movement when I was at Rutgers University. And um, I have a very fond memory of we would follow the university president. This is when we were trying to divest um, our university from investments in South Africa. And we were following our university president to his car and to parking lot. And one day, we went to the Board of Governors meeting of the university. And instead of you know, doing the right, r usual dialogue, people got up on the tables and started dancing <laughs> for apartheid. <laughs> and it was a really interesting and lovely way of bringing a heart space into something that was very serious. And um, as you know, our apartheid has, fa has fallen. And years later, I ended up having an incredible experience. I met one of the members of the African National Congress at the UN, who was now a member of his uh, parliament. And he was a uh, governmental representative to the United Nations. And here I was, you know, a former student doing my little piece, didn't know whether it was going to make a difference. And, and we met, our paths met. And we you know, had this amazing moment where he said to me, it was people all over the world did their part over, uh, over time. And eventually, something happened. And he was able to be free from prison. And he was now part of a dem democratic government. So that goes to show you, you never know where, what your actions will lead to. And it may not be your specific action that will be the tipping point, but you are part of the organic whole that's shifting that forward. Um, I had experiences with dealing with loggers on the front lines. I was um, living in Mendocino County, as I mentioned. And the timber wars were going on. Um, and I actually had an introduction to the timber wars by accident. I was um, going to uh, Humboldt State University as a student for a summer arts program. And I had no idea the timber wars were going on. And all I knew about California at that time was you know, from Rice Roney commercials, the cable cars. and from my Paul Bunyan stories, Lumberjacks. <laughs> so I got up there, and um, I was flying over in a small plane over Arcata, and was just looking on the ground and seeing all the devastation. And I said to somebody, what is that? And they said, that's a clear cut. And I said, oh my god. You know, it looked like a bomb went off. But make a long story short, I ran into loggers at a cafe, and I went up to them, naive. And I said, I want to know what this logging stuff is. You know, and, they were, and here are the timber wars that are going on. And, and I come up and confront them with this. And they actually sat down with me and explained to me what logging was. They were second and third generation log loggers. And I learned from them what Pacific Lumber was doing and Max Sam to the logging community up in Humboldt County at the time. So you weren't sure everybody knows what the Right. Um, in the, I'd say, 80s and 90s, logging had taken a corporate turn, profits over um, sustaining the resource. And the biggest, I guess, most famous story is Max Sam and Charles Hurwitz. He was involved with the junk bond uh, fiascos and he savings and loan Texas, savings and loan crisis. And he was taking over Pacific Lumber at, with junk, you know, buying it with junk bonds. and in order to pay the interest on the junk bonds, started cutting the forest. And instead of a few shifts 
one or two shifts a day, went round the clock logging, clear cutting, and devastating the, the resource when the former company, Pacific Lumber, was known for sustaining their um, timber holdings and treated the community very well. Max Sam and Charles Hurwitz actually were then raided the timber pension plans, the tim uh, pension plans of the uh, loggers. So uh, not only were they devastating the resource, they weren't treating the community very well anymore. Um, and that started the whole move toward um, devastation logging, as we call it, which is now happening around the world. But anyway, so the loggers, they pitted the loggers against the environmentalists. It was the environmentalists who's pro who, who were the ones that were, uh, as, you know, the ones who were forcing the jobs to be shut down. At that time, the jobs for uh, milling and, and some of the timber was being shipped to Mexico for cheaper labor. Um, the forest um, was being cut at a rate that we've never seen before. And people in the local community started standing up and saying no to this. And then we started getting pegged as, well, the people before me, including me now, we're being pegged as environmentalists, as those who are standing in the way of jobs and progress and profits. And in Mendocino County, we were having the same thing happen with um, Louisiana Pacific. And you might have heard of Judy Barry, who had been bombed. Check that out on the internet, because I don't have time to go into her story. She was on her way to we'll we'll film Yeah, OK, good. So anyway. so. Um, there was violence being directed toward environmentalists, and it was risky to go out there and take a stand for this. And one of the interesting experiences I had, we had a, um, I would go into the forest and do what's called recon work. And I would look at topographic maps with, with our watershed team, and we'd look at the California timber harvest plans the company filed with the state, and we'd go into the, for us to make sure and assess that the company was doing what they said they were doing. And we would find violations, and I would videotape them or photograph them or mark them on the map and come out of the forest and give them to our legal team or uh, to the watershed groups. And they would then submit them to uh, forest agencies or fish and game, et cetera. And one, uh, in one plan, it was. Uh, uh, I forget the name of the timber company. We had an injunction from a court, a superior court order, to stop the logging. And the company did not give the order to the employees. So we took it upon ourselves in the community to sleep at the gates the whole weekend and stop the logging. And we had some real angry loggers come up to us. And we couldn't leave. Otherwise, they would go in. And there was a lot of yelling going on. And you know, here we are, two hours at the gate. And you know, no sleep, and the logger is angry, and we just started dialoguing and dialoguing and dialoguing. And what we did was just really keep keep centered and grounded, and not flip into this anger that kind of feels like you get into a, a different. You're not really grounded when you're angry. You're just like all over the place. The anger is flying all over the place. And by the end of two hours, it was a progression. You know, we, you know, you get tired of standing, you get angry. I guess he got tired of it, yelling. I'm not sure what, but we kept our real calmness. We kept saying what we were standing for, not what we were standing against. And it was really interesting because he, all of a sudden, he comes from his truck. He went back to his truck and he comes back with an Earth First gen journal, and we were like, <laughs> Wow, what, why does the logger have a Earth First Journal. And then he started showing us something in there. And he says, you know, I really don't believe in this, this logging, but I have to do it because I need to you know, earn a living. And they're not doing it the way they're. And then he started coming out with his side of the story. And his anger was coming out at what was happening to the Earth and the timber company. Then he come, went back to his truck, and he brings out a wooden cross. <laughs> and he was talking about his cross and what what his faith meant to him and about you know Jesus and the earth and all that. And by the end of almost three hours, we, uh, 
we ended up hugging each other. And this was just a, like a real amazing experience. And I think it was all because that we stayed grounded, we didn't attack, and we, we were willing to listen. And then there was another great experience I had in New York City. Um, we were doing boycotts against the Gap. Uh, the <coughs> Fisher family who owns the Gap Empire, Old Navy, Banana Republic, they purchased 238,000 acres of forest land in Mendocino County. Poli Louisiana Pacific decided to leave the county and we thought, oh great, you know, we're going to have a new company, they're going to come in and they're going to do the right thing. And Louisiana Pacific Company actually cut themselves out of business and they left a, um, let's see, about 19 inches diameter inventory of trees with a, a little bit of old growth. So there was really not, not much merchantable timber <coughs> left. So here comes the Gap family and purchases this really cut over um, impacted forest. And we thought they were going to at least possibly be good stewards. And we went to them as a community. And it was quite beautiful to see all these people you know, from my community who've done years of research and really wanted to do something different and go to this family and ask them to, to give some money toward you know, restoring the resource to providing jobs for the unemployed loggers and fishermen. And the family said no, so make a long story short. You could see it in the Timber Gap video if you want to get a copy of it from um, um, the same place you got Headwaters Action Video Coll Collective. We'll have that film and tell you the story of that. So we launched a nationwide campaign, and we ended up Save the Redwoods, Boycott the Gap was what we called our campaign. And I was in New York City meeting with our New York City activists there. And we decided to do one of, the, one of many actions. And one of them, we wanted to reach the working class. So we picked Brook, Brooklyn. And there is an Old Navy, Old Navy store on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn. So we decided to create a press release that says Coho Salmon, which is indigenous to Mendocino County in our rivers, Coho Salmon swims to Old Navy on Atlantic Avenue in, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And we had a co someone uh, made a Coho puppet, brought it in a taxi cab. But I, when I got there, there was all these police barricades and this real tough sergeant and um, made us get in these, felt like we were in pens behind this barricade. And then there was this other fellow from another movement um, wanted, wanted to give out literature and started to haggle with the police. And I said, get back in here in the, you know, in the pen. I said, number one, we don't have legal observers. Number two, there's only three of us here. If they take us away now, nobody's going to know what happened to us. So get in here and shut up. <laughs> cool it. Because this anger is not going to get us anywhere. So he got in the pen. And then um, the puppet came. And then I invited a, f a musician friend of mine, Ray Corona, who does a lot of um, events. And we were in the pen, and we were singing. And then little by little, we snuck out of the, the barricades. And we're all on a sidewalk. And police weren't saying anything. And I do have a picture of New York City police playing air guitar <laughs> and singing. And at the end of our, you know, because in New York City, you have to make appointments for your activism and rallies. And we had to end by a certain time, and we did. And the sergeant comes marching up to us. And he says to us, <coughs> says to me, he says, I want to be assigned to your next event. And I said, why? He was like kind of real tough. And he says, because I really like what you're doing, and I want to be part of it, <laughs> you know? So, you know, I've been, been through a lot of hellacious protests, the Battle of Seattle, the tear gassing, uh, watching people getting beaten. I don't know how you could do that on a larger level. But um, even the Battle of Seattle, protesters going there and staying nonviolent really made a difference and changed things around the world. Um, you know, this is some, I mean, I have a lo lot of stories, and I could um, ask, answer some questions later. And I think Running Wolf, who ran out, is up next. But, but um, yeah. Right. To, to be respectful of our time constraints, but just since we've got another minute here, mm -hmm. do you want to just say like, 
one thing about what it's been like to be in the Oak Grove, what you've done there, or it's, what it's like to be uh, a tree sitter? It's intense because, um, I, you know, anytime you walk in a grove and if you're a, a tree sitter or a former tree sitter or a ground support, you, you, don't, you have this edge of feeling hunted because when the police, now, you know, we almost feel like an animal, how an animal feels to be chased and moved and all that. And, um, and I think that's um, something we have to kind of pay attention to. It's like it's not just about us saving the trees because they're beautiful, because this is an ecosystem that not, not only provides life for us and you know, gives us life without asking for anything in return, it provides a habitat for a whole ecosystem for, every, for something we can't even see that's happening. So, um, for the spe and we're here, we're there also for the species who can't speak for themselves. Okay, thank you. So, Running Wolf is going to talk mm. about the Native American experience and perspective about the Oak Grove and his experience as an activist. And Also, I should mention that Running Wolf is a past and future mayoral candidate for the city. Thank you. Hi, my name is Zachary Running Wolf. I'm from the Kuni tribe, Blackfeet Nation in Montana. Uh, there are 85,000 Native Americans here in the Bay Area, which is the second largest Native population only in Oklahoma City. Um, also, that doesn't include the Hispanic people who are Native. So if you count them into the equation, you get a much larger. Half of African Americans have native blood. So now you start to talk about between two and three million people in the Bay Area who have native blood. So let's get that. Um, I led the tree sit on December 2nd into the Oak Grove, um, the morning of the big game. I say that we played our own big game and we trumped the uh, powers that be. On the, uh, the first day that we took the trees, uh, in, on the New York Post website and the LA Times, instead of listing the big game's score, they say protesters have taken the trees. So uh, this has turned into a world issue. It's gone around the world. Uh, this is vital. This is larger than those 42 trees that were up there trying to save. Uh, many issues have come out of this tree sit, including the experience of being in a tree, which I myself have gained. In the native culture, we are now considered the tree people up at the Oak Grove. We are considered a tribe. We are protectors of these, what we call in the native community, standing people. These are living beings. And so Matthew is, uh, does great work with nonviolence. But what is violent and nonviolence? We are violent every day and we don't even know it. Who drives a car here? Yeah. Where do you think that oil comes from? There is serious violence going on right now in not just Iraq, but all over the world not just to people either, to the environment. We are nucle nuclear bombing the Middle East. That's going to be around, depleted uranium is around for 100,000 years. It's blowing in the wind. This is very, very violent. As far as who lives in the house? Yeah, very violent. Those are tree people cut down. That's a very violent action. Who eats meat? I do. Very violent. So um, what I'm getting to is basically we have 4% of our old growth left. Four. Just four. So we are up there defending trees that should be landmarked. We landmark buildings here, dead trees, killed trees, murdered trees in the city of Berkeley that are 80 years 100 years old, but we have 200-year-old living things that are helping us 
recycle our waste, and we're set to cut it down for a good football team. That's insanity. This university is completely insane. Um, so we're up in these trees. We've been there for 109 days. I am so proud of everyone who's participated in this. The community has come together on different issues. We have three lawsuits, including the city of Berkeley against this university. This university refuses to back down, even though it's on the fault line. We've had five earthquakes during this time. There's a crack in the southern part of the stadium. Unbelievable. It's a death trap. The structure, I'm, I'm in the construction business. There is, uh, in 1925, when this was built, it's probably required rebar probably six feet wide. Now, if you go by uh, the Bay Bridge or other overpasses, the grids are about this big. Uh, concrete is a very rigid, rigid material, and during a violent earthquake, it'll come down in pieces. Wood structures tend to sway. So basically, the university is full of it. They are basically putting not only the student athletes at risk, but they're putting 70,000 people who are going to occupy that stadium on in, in danger. Whew, that's not it. It's a World War I war memorial veteran, uh, veterans memorial. It has been landmarked by the federal government as an historical grove. And finally, and most importantly, it's a burial ground. It's a Native American burial ground. Uh, 1925, they found three bodies under there. Somebody brought us a piece of paper that worked for the university stating this. So now it's a federal issue because you're dealing with Native Americans. We do not have a relationship with Tom Bates. We do not have a relationship with Arnold Schwarzenegger. We have a relationship, although it's not a good one, <laughs> with Mr. Bush and crew. So um, this thing is huge. And this university is not backing down. Why? You should come out on Wednesdays when Professor Chapella is out there taking us through these walks describing what's going on at this university. What's going on at this university? Do you know the nuclear bomb was invented here? We talk about free, free speech movement. They're pimping that. We, we, it is genetically altered foods, nanotechnology, computer science. Basically, this university is the enemy of Mother Earth, the way I look at it. It has a, I don't know if you know about power lines with the Illuminati. You should start looking into the Illuminati. This thing is huge. This is not just about this oak grove, because there's, what did I list, about seven or eight different reasons why they should be stopped, but they keep coming. British Petroleum, $500 million in genetically altered food. This is control of the world's energy source, corn ethanol. This is very, very serious, and they will not stop. Chappella pointed out this power line which goes through NORAD to Washington, D.C., goes through the university, right through the prison industrial complex, which is called Alcatraz, and goes out to the east. Yeah. This is basically probably the biggest fight in North America, is right up at your own growth. And it involves very serious things. I have now two felony counts against me. I am going to be running for mayor. The reason why I have felony counts, because then they can knock me out of even having a voice in the mayorship. Last election, I brought up some ugly, ugly things about this university. $300 million in perks to their top executives. Yeah, I said, well, if Berkeley's starving for money, why don't we just divide 
the $300 million in just perks alone to the 10 universities, that's $30 million for the city of Berkeley. They didn't like that. Yeah. See, I'm bringing, I give up the mayor's salary because I'm a native leader, not a politician. I give to the community. I protect the children. That is something that's different. And we are at the turning point in the world's history. And I do have to apologize to your generation. My generation has left you a very, very dark time. Understand that. I've ridden this bike for six years. I don't understand what's going on in this world when we have traffic jams out there, we have a war over oil, and we have global warming. Yeah, I'm being accused of the stop driving campaign. I support whoever's doing that 200%. But we need this, I mean, it's, it's really simple. Stop flying, stop driving. Stop these people. It's really, really simple, but it's on you. A lot of people look, oh, there's nothing I can do. 90% of this battle is inward. 90% of it is inward. We have control. That's their big game. Is they're, they're fooling you into thinking of this globalization. Act locally, and they will go globally. We need to get back to our roots. That's why we're making that stand up in the Oak Grove. We have blessed this community with education as far as like simple ecology. These trees, they're trying to say that three trees, they're going to replace three trees for every one that they take down. But little saplings don't recycle the air like 200 year old Oak Grove trees. That, that equation doesn't work. So, Anyway, going to my culture, like how do you live with nature? That's, that's what we're facing. And this is, we're coming on the Mayan calendar where Indians shall live again. This is the prophecy. My culture, this is the last battle. My culture teaches you that you only take what you need. For instance, if you need wood for your house or whatever, you go up on the tree and you cut the dead limb off. That helps the tree flourish. You look at the environment and see what is available for you to take. We, as I'm a medicine person in the native community, we only take the brown stuff off. You never take the green. That, the creator has made that so that the medicine is most ripe at that time. It's living within nature. When we ran, I come from the Blackfeet Nation, when we ate meat. We ran the buffalo, so the buffalo would run, the sick and the elderly would come off, and we would take them, making the herd stronger. We were a vital part of nature. We were not above it. We were right there with it, an integral part. One of our elders said, the biggest, the biggest crime that this country took from Native people was our gathering right. Because we went in to the forest and we took the dead wood out. We set fires when we needed to. Yes, fire is good for nature. They found that out in Yellowstone. So we would go in like California basket weavers. They would go in and take the brown marsh, weave their baskets, made the marshes grow. So we were, there is a way to live with nature. And now it's time for us to learn. What's going on at the Oak Grove? Yes, Mary's right. We've become a tribe. See, Native people, everybody can be Native. It's not red people ruling over white people or black people or whatever. It's teaching. It's teaching how to get back in touch with the environment. So us Native people are here to do it. It's already happening. South America has broken off uh, the uh, Chavez, paid off the World Bank. Chiapas has broken away. Guadalajara, uh, the Inuit are suing the U.S. in world court. There are casinos popping up all around here. Yes, 
we, we are starting, and I'm running for mayor. Um, also doing bike rides to Albuquerque, New Mexico, promoting biodiesel, solar, and wind to take the native community into the front seat. This is our country. This is called Turtle Island. You may need to know this for your survival. We are getting down to crunch time. It's not whether we are going to, this society is going to collapse. It's going to collapse. There is no doubt about it. Money is the enemy of Mother Nature. So that, that has to go. Economic motivation. I heard about this green economy. That's bullshit. That is a load of crap. No. We need to get in touch with nature and get away from economic destruction. Are you ready for it? There's 9 million people living in this area alone. And when corporate America takes a dive, you got 9 million people looking for food and water. Yeah. We have temperatures in this last week. I love looking brown. And I was out there in shorts. Yeah, I was enjoying it. But it was damn scary to be in the beginning of March and have summer weather out there. We need to wake up now. And so if you can manage to come to this tree sit, we're trying to branch it out. We are branching it out. There's student activists here who are organizing. I, you know, I love them. We need to wake up now, though. Um, going back to the violence part, um, I feel that taking, oh, OK, this is the last point. Um, I was uh, quoted in the newspapers that uh, violence can be a good tool because I said that if somebody comes up that tree after me, I will feel threatened at 65 feet and I'll throw your ass on out of it. I was quoted, attack on me is an attack on my people. I'm a native leader and elder. That has stopped this university from taking those trees. It also, when one person does an action like this, it also, if you do not agree with it, it helps you get a little bit more confidence. And I've seen it in our group. Even though they don't particularly take my point of view, they feed off it and go, wait a minute, Renny Wolf is making a stand here, and he's willing to go to jail for it. Anyway, it looks like it's my time. I'd like to thank you. Yeah. yeah. Coming up. Anybody? The question was, what are the state of the court cases right now? Yeah. Well, the in, there's a temporary injunction. And the judge had ordered that all court cases have to be heard. So that means there is no cutting of the trees until that happens. But it doesn't mean that the university could come in and fence it off and start doing some preliminary work. And so far, they haven't had done that. Otherwise, you'd probably hear about it. <laughs> I think what changed was when we got the native uh, burial site confirmed, that uh, putting a fence around the, uh, a sacred site would be politically incorrect. And so it's a PR game that we're playing here a lot. Um, I hear a lot of resentment in other classes from sports people and people outside of maybe this community. And I was wondering what the O campaign is doing to address that and to you know, bring that bond close together um, I ran for mayor, as you well know, um, last election. There's three sites on this campus that have potential. Even Mayor Bates specified the Edwards track would be a good spot for the gym. We are not against a new gym. Um, and also, there's many places like Telegraph Avenue, which were cited as blight or economically depressed. 
So there are many places within this city, including the downtown plan, which the university garnished over the last 10 to 15 years. They have control of the downtown. So there's absolutely plenty of places that um, you can put this sports facility. So the question is, there seems to be a break and a, or a difference or separation between the sports community and others who feel opposite, maybe. of. Well, I was at the Grove one day, and one of the football players from the Cal team, who I shall not mention because he's under contract and he can't make public statements, was totally outraged that the trees were going to be cut. And we asked him if, we, if he could go to the Daily Cal and even write an editorial about how he loves nature. And he says, I can't do that because I'm under scholarship and contract. Sports fans and Cal alumni, I was at the mayor's um, um, annual Christmas gathering last December, and I had an alumni sports fan we were talking about the Grove, and he said to me, if it means us not going to the Rose Bowl, not having a stadium, I'd rather have the trees. So what's interesting as you know, I'm, I'm a resident of Berkeley, and what the students aren't seeing is there are laws here in Berkeley that protect these trees. We're not a bunch of hippies. I mean, if you saw all the people that participate in this I mean, call me a hippie, fine. Well, sometimes I look like a hippie when I'm out there. And s maybe they're all real hippies. I can't tell the difference. But when you're out sleeping out there or in a tree, you kind of all start looking like the same. But anyway, um, and there's everybody from homeless to people with PhDs and high-level jobs and, and political leaders and everybody in between. I would, I would also like to uh, add that there are athletes, especially the lacrosse team, which is very ironic because it's a Native American sport, but um, who are very supportive of our movement. In fact, we did a sports show, a national sports broadcast during the Super Bowl, and one of the uh, we were on a national sportscasting uh, radio, and they were trying to clown us, and they interviewed one of the uh, probably the most famous sports women sportscaster from Miami. She phoned in, and they, the final comment was. What, it, what would you say to the tree sitters, these professional hippies? She said, C stay in the trees and don't come down. <laughs> totally. I, I have a specific request. I'd like to see if you can really tell the story about how you were interacting with the athletes who were throwing bottles and swearing at you at the beginning of the tree sit. I think you said there were some football players, and you said something to them that changed the dynamic totally. Do you remember that story? Um, I don't. Quite remember. It. I mean, if you can jog down. No, I remember the bottles, but I don't remember. <laughs> what, what quite. Remember is that you had said that there were some students of color who were throwing bottles, and swearing, and then you said something about the connection between the Native American experience in this country and the experience of African Americans. Yeah, that's that's true, and also, um, um, and what I what I've threatened to bring up is that, and I hope this crosses over to the dominant culture's football players, but I, I'm sure the colored players would not like playing on my ancestors. And I will go to the football team and say, look, this new gym will be disturbing my ancestors. Are you willing to play for this football team? And I guarantee you there'll be some, some uh, people of color who play football who will not like that. And so if you want to talk about success of a football team, I think you better move that, that gymnasium because I think a lot of your good athletes will have a problem with disturbing my ancestors. And, you know, if we went up to my, Montclair and decide to put a football stadium on that, on the ancestors up there, do you think we'd have a problem up there? So why is us, our, us Native people are treated differently, especially when we hold the answer to live with nature. I want, I, want to, uh, I want to remind everybody that 
this every Sunday at 2 o'clock is a salon. Two amazing women who are PhDs have been holding a salon with different guests every Sunday at 2 o'clock. And this Sunday is going to be Tree Stories, and uh, I'm asking you to come with your experiences, personal experiences and stories about trees or your favorite tree poems. I, I'm thinking of the wor uh, the question was for those who couldn't hear, um, how did we deal with violence if we came in t into, if we met that in a protest? I had two quick stories. One was downtown Berkeley, our first uh, boycott the Gap protest at the Gap store when it was there. We were tying up our protests and we were chanting, and really the energy was moving. One fellow was sh sh shaking with such rage, he was r ready to bash in the windows, and I had to hold him and whisper into his ear, brother, they're not the enemy, it's not the employees. But it was, it was, he was banging against the windows, and just, and, and they had to lock the doors. So it was pretty scary, but I just wrapped my arms around him and just tried to whisper, this is not about them. This is not about them. I understand you're angry. And the other one was at the um, World Bank protest in Washington, D.C. There was, uh, on top of the hill, it was pouring rain, and there was about 10 people sitting in meditation uh, with ponchos, and uh, the army and tanks and police with shields were uh, behind a barricade. And behind, down on the hill, was the black rock marching up and really intense and I said oh my god they're just gonna blow it this is not the time for that energy so I ran down the hill and I ran up to the fellow who looked like the leader all I saw was his black you know mask and black everything and I said brother please this is what's happening explain what was going on and he gave me the finger and called me a f and peace Nazi and um and just turned around and went the other way. And I said, oh, now they're really angry at me now. And they're going to take that anger and put it somewhere else. So I ran down a hill, and I s told a friend of mine to come with me. He says, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, but i got to chill them out. So I went up to him, and I, the same guy who gave me that, it was just such an intense gesture right in my face. And I said, brother, I appreciate what you're doing. You all are part of this struggle with us. And I apologize if I offended you, and I love you. And he turned around, and he came up to me, and he kissed me. <laughs> <laughs> and I could see his eyes, because the first time, his eyes were angry, and they were like knives. And then that other, the second time, they were just really peaceful. And they went the other way. And I don't really have an um, example, but I have an example of my community in a historical point of view. Um, in our... I come from a warrior, the Plains. Um, we did things through medicine. In other words, we would go up to, s to solve an argument, and we would count coup. So our first action would go up to somebody's village and touch them on the back. And that meant the next time, the creator allowed me to come into your village and touch you on the back. The next time I come, you're done. So. It was a very nonviolent. You can't go through North America and find an archaeology site with a thousand warriors in it. We didn't do that. Prior to contact, there was a hundred million people plus living on this continent without jails. Yeah. Yeah. So when we, Martin Luther King talked about the promised land going to the mountain, Christopher Columbus landed on it. That's reality. Because the biggest punishment was to be ostracized by the tribe. So you were just simply asked to leave. That was our greatest punishment. We did have one death penalty. If you touched the children wrong, we strung you up. To this day, we still not have found a cure for child molestation. It tends to ripple out. Yeah.
It was wonderful to hear from you because uh, all these poor people get all semester long as an airhead standing up here talking about theory. And it was just great to hear from people who are actually out there doing it. I wanted to make two comments before you leave about some of the things that you said. One was I was very touched by your talking about Zach about the way that you live with the earth in a sustainable way and only taking the things that are because one of the principles that we start out with in this semester is, in fact, even last semester, is if you're a nonviolent person, you believe that your whole life can be based on that principle and there is no conflict which is not resolvable. What makes a conflict seem that you can't resolve it is only when your ego gets involved. And I told the story about one of our great peace researchers, Johann Galtung, who's been going around in the Middle East talking to uh, Muslim people and talking to the Westerners and he came up with the determination that what we need in the West, we think we need anyway, is we need access to their hydrocarbons. You know, we need to get out their oil and what they need is they need respect for, the, for their religion. And if we would both recognize that, there would be no conflict and it struck me that there's a parallel. Like we can, just as we can live in nature off the excess of nature and recycle uh, our products with nature. Similarly, in human relationships, there's absolutely no reason why there has to be a deadly conflict in order to solve anything. So I just really loved hearing you say that. Now the other thing, since you being my willing prisoner for one minute more, I want to make an observation and that is you're, you're listing off all the reasons why they shouldn't take that particular grove and those are all good reasons. But from the point of view of a nonviolent conflict, the more reasons is not actually a plus. From the point of view of a nonviolent conflict, what we'd like to have, what we call sometimes a nonviolent moment, is these trees are sacred, your stupid football team is not. And just have it be very, very clean. That's not a reason for you not to cite these. But to the extent that you bring in these other things, it's going to compromise you when you go to the next grove that they're after. Because maybe that one won't be on a burial ground. You see what I'm saying? And, all of the, and maybe it won't be on an earthquake fault. So they're smart. They've got PhDs. They're going to find one that isn't on an earthquake fault. And you won't have all those other things. So I'm, I'm, mind you, I'm not telling you what to do. I, I only tell these people what to do. <laughs> but I am saying that from the point of view of really making the conflict uh, clear and educating people that the life of the trees is sacred, uh, bringing in those other reasons is not helping. Well, thanks again. It was really great hearing from you. Don't forget your bicycle. I would be really tempted to take it. I lost <laughs> two of them already. This is Yes. Oscar, could I see you after class? Yeah. Let's talk for a minute after class. You can take it now if you like. Okay. Okay. Well, that was uh, that was a wonderful thing. Um, I'd like to also mention that we've just had a die-in in the East Bay, and some of our people were involved in that, and. Uh, I don't know, John, do you want to say anything about that or maybe on Thursday? 
Okay. Let me try to get into the midterm ideas and stuff like that, see how far I can get. I also wanted to mention that there are two resources that I want to share with you now that you're starting to look at doing a paper. One of them is there's a chart in my office called 100 Years of Nonviolence. And it, it's in French, but if you uh, come in sometime when I'm there, between you, me, and a dictionary, we can figure out what it's saying. <laughs> it's got some pictures. Uh, and it gives you a very nice sort of overview of what's been going on from the French anti-nuclear perspective. Uh, the other resource is, I've mentioned it a long time ago, there is a box in the bookcase that's opposite Professor Sanders' office, which is labeled PAX 164B. And that's a big random collection of newsletters and things like that from <coughs> ongoing uh, organizations. Okay. So a few general things about uh, midterms and how to deal with them psychologically <laughs> and otherwise. I wanted you to know that there are two possible things that can go wrong, uh, generally speaking, with a midterm. You can get a very poor grade or you can get a very good grade. And if you get a very poor grade, their course is a very poor grade. So that in itself is unfortunate. However, we practice restorative rather than retributive approaches to grading in this course. And that means that, for example, if you got a C in the midterm and you get an A in the final, we figured out, we figured the way we look at it is the point was for you to learn the stuff uh, at some point before the semester was over. So you will get much better than a B as the exam part of your grade, which is half of the grade goes along with the paper. So it might be a B plus or an A minus, depending on you know, how things actually stack up, how, how I feel in the morning and so forth. So don't, don't be depressed if you got a bad grade, but be galvanized. This is a, a – please close the door carefully. Yeah. <laughs> now the other problem is sometimes you get an excellent grade on the midterm and you think, oh, this is a breeze. I don't have to work anymore. We're going to call this the paradox of expression. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, don't let that happen to you. The course is cumulative. Some of the most important material will be happening subsequent to the midterm. So keep the momentum going. Um, I thought there were three things about the midterm, and I can't remember what the third one was for now, so we'll just move on. Um, we are going to s- yeah, Maria. Yeah. That's what I'm going to be doing right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, for the next uh, – as much time as we got. I'm going to just go through the IDs. And uh, I hope you understand my attitude here is that the midterm is as much an, a test for me as it is for you because I can see from the midterm what I didn't go do clearly. So uh, again, it's a more restorative than a retributive approach. Incidentally, Inca, I hope you appreciated hearing from Zachary Running Wolf because that's something you don't get in Europe. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you don't have Native Americans in Europe. <laughs> we are your Native Americans. <laughs> uh, okay, so let me just go through them one after another. With EDSA, there was some confusion about whether what I was asking you to describe was the 77-hour climax of the movement or the whole opposition movement which lasted for more than two years. So because I, well, I didn't make it clear, I didn't take off any points. But it is – in some cases, I got the impression that you thought that the whole movement took place in 77 hours and it just sprang up spontaneously when Marcos uh, gypped on the election. That would be a big mistake because that's the mistake that the media makes all the time. This is a mob descended on Belgrade is their formula. Or in the case of the 1991 resistance against the coup d'etat – in Russia, that focused particularly in Moscow, the press had absolutely no idea that people were doing nonviolent training in there <laughs> six to eight months before that thing happened. As far as they knew, it just sprang up out of the soil. It's random. It, uh, then it goes back down again after the event is over. This is probably one of the biggest holes in the thinking process, if that's the word we want, of the general public when it comes to nonviolence, that they think ju it just happens and then it, does, then it goes away. So they have no idea that you can do training for this and you can do organizing. And that's – of course, this is critical because um, remember the argument about 
the madman with the sword where we have argued that under extreme circumstances you may actually have to use lethal force. By the way, I'm not sure that Zach's example was a, a good <laughs> example of this, but <laughs> in case you were wondering. But in extreme cases, like to protect a bunch of people where you have no time to do any communicating, you may have to use uh, force. You may have to use lethal force. You try to do this psychologically in a way that um, – keeps it out of the inward violence at least. But if you remember the main point that you have to remember in conjunction with that example, it's important that people know that example because otherwise they'll think that nonviolence is a moral thou shalt not sort of thing and they'll never realize that it's a force. So at a certain point we have to share that example. But we must immediately add this is not a reason that you can prepare for using lethal force. Because if you have a chance to prepare, then you can prepare nonviolence. I'm just, it's just sort of an opportune time for me to mention that. So sometimes EDSA, which, which is the name of an intersection, Esplanade de los Santos, uh, is taken to mean that climax, but sometimes it's taken to mean the people power movement. I wasn't clear about which I was asking for, so that's not your problem. But it becomes your problem if you don't realize that Hildegard Gussmeyer was in there for two years and the base communities were working and the church was working on people and there was all of this preparation. Okay. Um, let's see. Then on the question about uh, Shanti Das, so Lanza, da, Lanza del Vasto, Mostly you all knew who he was, which is not surprising because I'd shown you his picture and given you his whole life story. But a slight mistake that happens sometimes on that ID is that people went off into the Larzac campaign, which is sort of natural since I spent – because of delays in one thing and another, I spent three days talking about it. So naturally it would tend to come up. But if the question is about him, I wanted you to talk about the other things that he had gotten involved in, the anti – torture campaigns in Algeria, the anti-nuclear campaigns in uh, the rest of Europe and in France and so forth. And of course uh, his importance lay in the fact that he, he brought expertise into the area which did not exist there and yet he was able to touch on feelings that people had there on the ground, you know, about their land and their livelihood and so forth. So it was a good blend of stuff that those people didn't have but using stuff that they did have without this attitude of peace imperialism. Uh, John? Yeah. I said just a really brief tick off. Like in the case of Hildegard Gossmeyer, she was in Central America and she was in Guatemala. She was in the uh, – preeminently in the, uh, in the People Power campaign. And she's also a writer and has been involved. You know, just yeah, keep it really short, but at least so that you know. Yeah. And in the case of a person or an event, please give me some sense of when this happened. You know, uh, I myself am so bad at numbers <laughs> that I don't think it's fair for me to ask you to be absolutely accurate. But it's nice to know approximately when these people lived or when these events happened. And in fact, it would be even nicer if you got it exactly right. And be <laughs> more, more than I could do, but it would be very nice. Okay. Let me see. Um, yeah. The next one was the nonviolent moment. Uh, I really must not have been very clear about this. A nonviolent moment is <coughs> the climax of a well orchestrated nonviolent campaign. And incidentally, uh, I sensed that there was some confusion about the – about terms like a principle – jot these down – principle, institution, an event, otherwise known as an episode or an encounter, a campaign, an organization, and a movement. You, s you see what I'm doing? I'm starting from something that's not – materially represented at all. And I'm talking about building it up into longer and longer lasting types of 
of social development of organization. So I don't use these terms in any special technical sense, fortunately, because most of the rest of my vocabulary is pretty specialized here. It won't do you much good once you get out of 24 Warren. But just be clear in your mind what those terms mean because this, there was some confusion and it really, it really hurt getting clarity on the IDs. Okay, so having said that, what is a nonviolent moment? A nonviolent moment is like – you remember last semester we compared a nonviolent interaction to a conversation. It has a similar dynamic to a conversation in the sense that if your opponent is distracted, that's not a good time to press forward with your issue, much less to take advantage of them. And this is called the non-embarrassment. Right. Gandhi was – Fabulous at this. He at one at one point, he actually it was the it was the the key log that got pulled out of the log jam that released the whole success of the South Africa campaign. It was when there was a potential for embarrassing the government because uh, European striker railroad workers were going on strike. He immediately shut down the Satyagraha in order not to embarrass them. Them and I said that the the dynamic here that helps us understand it is let's say I'm having a conversation with uh, Matthias and somebody else walks by who's a friend of yours. You go, you're paying attention to them. That's not when I want to make my most cogent point. You know? <laughs> so but what you're doing as a nonviolent actor, individual or group, you can take charge of the dynamic of the situation. You have to be opportunistic and take advantage of opportunities when they occur. But also remember what Ben Kingsley said in the movie. He said it's not only generals who know how to plan campaigns. We are in charge. So one thing to know about a nonviolent moment that you know, very few of you mentioned was you can actually plan for that. You can so arrange things that they're going to be forced to hit you with what they've got. And you're going to be in a position to take it and then – you're going to win. And that's uh, – you know, it's not 100 percent guarantee except on the, the work versus work level. Yeah, RB? There's no – I guess I'm not trying to say – from what I understood about the nonviolent moment is like as a result of a nonviolent campaign, like this moment will happen. Like I didn't know it was planned. It doesn't have to be planned. It can sometimes come around without your planning. And then because you've taken PAX 164B, you know what's happening. And you take full advantage of it. But you can also plan it. That's not essential. The essential thing is that a nonviolent struggle of any kind with any duration, it starts off with people really not quite understanding each other. You know, you, you – I, I was just up in Ashland, Oregon and there's a peace community up there and they had a letter writing campaign at my instance actually because they were going to have a candlelight vigil and I said – I don't think so. So they had a letter writing campaign. Uh, and they wrote a letter to their senator. But at one point in this letter when I saw it, I was kind of embarrassed because they said, we are going to insist on holding you to this promise. You don't talk to your representative like that when you're only a small fraction of his um, constituency and you're just beginning the conversation. So at first, he's not going to take you seriously. You, you say, I want you to pull out of Iraq. And he says, oh, sure, sure. I've got nine other people who don't want me to, so too bad. You have to prove to him that you mean it and you're not going to take no for an answer on the one hand. And on the other hand, that you're not going to be pulled into personalistic hatreds or disrespect against him if it's a him that you're dealing with. That you're absolutely serious about both of these things. Even you won't know how serious you are until the moment comes along and you're really tested. You know, who can say? If you go into a campaign and you say, I'm not going to back down and then, you know, people are being beat up and there's tear gas and stuff like that, who knows how we're going to react. But if you've done your preparation well, 
in any nonviolent interaction, there'll be jo jostling and maneuvering and maneuvering and jostling. If you keep holding on to truth and they keep doing their threat power thing, at some point there's bound to be a collision. And it becomes clear what they stand for and what you stand for. That's the nonviolent moment. Ideally, you've planned it. Otherwise, you just take advantage of it. Okay. So the, the was moments. moments, plural? No, no, nonviolent moments. Yeah. I think on my page it said nonviolent moments. It says moment on. No, that's why some of you wrote movement. So two or three people wrote movement on their paper, and I said, why are they doing that? I'll have to look at the exam. I'm sorry. Uh, if it said movement, it was totally a mistake. And uh, I know I wrote about the nonviolent movement. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, does everybody have their? Uh, no, you don't have your exam paper. You gave them to me. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> There's no evidence. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Well, uh, it's just between me and the shredder at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm really sorry if I if, – because there were two versions of this, and I'm really sorry if that somehow happened. But what it meant to say was nonviolent moment. Okay. Yeah, Maria. Ah. Well, I, if, you have to understand, for, for someone like me who's like five foot six, to have a, a happy moment in a basketball game, you have to write about it. You have to enshrine it in a book, right? Uh, <laughs> but if I remember correctly, I did not call that a nonviolent moment. I called it a peak experience. Yeah. And I, that did lead to some confusion because I suppose you could argue that the conversion experience that, you, that the nonviolent actor goes through, you could call that a nonviolent moment, but let's not. Let's, let's keep the definitions clean for the same reason that I was just talking to. Zach about. Amy? Yes, you could say that. In fact, let's say it. <laughs> a nonviolent <laughs> moment is a peak experience, but a peak experience is not necessarily a nonviolent moment. There could be other kinds of peak experience after a, a strong cup of chai or something like that. Uh, but also, I think that when we use the term, we're talking about group dynamics and not about the feeling state, you know, tone, something like that. So, Matthew? Can I point out two other things about the nonviolent moment that I think strike me as being very interesting? Uh -huh. One is that the nonviolent moment may or may not result in an immediate success mm -hmm. for the nonviolent resistance. And I mean, we, that mm -hmm. did happen in EdFest, right? That was clearly a success where the mm -hmm. pilot was looking down at the crowd and had the trigger. Mm -hmm. and Something mm -hmm. that happened where basically you know, the oppressor had two choices, which is to you know, back down or to escalate the oppression in a you know, poor, horrific manner. Mm -hmm. and there you have the immediate success when you do your work. On the other hand, um, the, the, the nonviolent moment of the India struggle was the Dar es Salaam salt raid, which was absolutely not a success. This was no salt mm -hmm. was created, no salt was obtained, and all the protesters just got absolutely brutally beaten into the ground, so it did not succeed, but it worked on the Mm -hmm. The media reports of the event <coughs> ultimately led to the final mm -hmm. success of the Indian cause. Mm -hmm. And then the other, and then the other point is to say that if if you don't really have your strategy in place and you're not thinking through how you're organi organizing and orchestrating it, the whole thing could actually be a whiteout, which was kind of what Tiananmen Square was. That was sort of a, I, I don't know if you would agree with that. Like I would I would say there was not a nonviolent moment there. Okay. We wouldn't even call it that. No. Okay. Because uh, they were stuck to one strategy and they were not really in uh, a negotiation with the other side. They were just clinging to something and they got kicked in the face. Yeah. But that's not how the term is used. Definitely you don't want to get killed that's, uh, <laughs> if you can possibly help it. Yeah. No, it, it would be interesting to study why there was not a nonviolent moment in that campaign. I 
I think you could say that because that on that confrontation depended the rest of the whole campaign. So in a way, you could say that day was a nonviolent, the nonviolent moment of a campaign that had gone on for two years. Or you could also say that that particular standoff when the mayor of Chachak is talking to the police, it was their nonviolent moment, undramatic as it may have seemed. Yeah. But you get the, you get the idea. So it's M-O-M-E-N-T. Okay. Now the next ID uh, also requires a good bit of comment and that is a question of interpretation. I think I misled some of you. In particular, I misled you, Amy, <coughs> when I said that this is the weak link in TP and I. I think you got – you drew two wrong conclusions from that, which was my fault. One, that, that interpretation itself is weak. Where what I meant to say was this has been the least developed. It's the, this, this the weakest link in the whole chain of change that would come about as a result of nonviolence. That's what I meant to say. We have people risking their lives. They do brilliant things. They save other human beings. All of that is terrific. They're doing it on a shoestring. And then what? Dot, dot, dot. There's no response from the world because the world didn't hear that it happened and if they did, they didn't have a frame of reference to put it in. They would not be able to assimilate the lesson of what they are hearing. So it, I meant when I said it was weak, I didn't mean that interpretation itself is weak. Interpretation can be the strongest thing that you've got. But it's weak in the sense that it has not been developed and it, it's clear why it has not been developed when uh, we reached the point in nonviolent peace force where we had this convening event in Delhi, by that time we already had, I think, 17 countries who were asking us to come and intervene in their country. And we weren't even strong enough to do one of them. And people are dying. People are being tortured. So everyone who's on the ground doing this, they do it 110 percent and they don't have time to go back and interpret. So that's where people like us can play our most significant role. Now there was one exception to that. Witness for Peace, when it started out, what they did was they had these tours. They took people to these villages in Nicaragua and then brought them back to talk to people in the communities here about what low intensity conflict actually looks like on the ground. So they were doing a little bit of political consciousness raising. But that wasn't what I'm calling interpretation. Interpretation means – what happened in Moscow in 1991, what happened in Belgrade in 2000, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, were not flukes. It was not a coincidence. It was a result of a scientific dynamic <coughs> which we could study if peace and conflict studies only had enough of a budget to keep this course going. Okay, sorry. That was a little bit of a uh, plug. Okay, anything else that you wanted to ask about the, the ones that we've talked about so far? Edsa, Shanti Das, Nonviolent Moment Interpretation. Andrea? I'm still not clear what interpretation is. Okay, let me give you an example of how it works. Uh, PBI and NP and Witness and all of these groups, they go out and they do all these wonderful things on the ground. They, th it's really I, – I can't – overstate how much uh, we should admire and appreciate these people. They are risking their life for peace for all of us. And yet uh, nobody hears about it except, you know, their parents, their friends. So they go and write some books about it like Hebron Journal and like the, the new book that Elizabeth Boardman has written. Is that called Taking a Stand? I hope not because there's another book called Taking a Stand that's coming out now. I'm supposed to write a preface for it. That we do, huh? That's a serious mistake. I've got to get – do some emails right now. Um, but anyway, back to your question. She writes a book describing what has happened and that's already a big plus because most people don't even realize that there are groups out there doing it. But we need to, to do the interpretation. We need to explain why it happened, how it actually worked. We need to tell people that there is inside every one of us a desire for, for unity, 
nonviolent person is unable to wake up that unit, that desire. We need to explain that when there's a uh, Esquadron de Muerte that goes out there to kill some people and suddenly there's a, a European person standing in the way, they haven't got orders from their captain, from their commander, what to do, so they rush back. Yes, on one level, these people like to operate in the dark, but on another level, this, the, the dynamic is really within themselves. They go there thinking that these miserable villagers are, villagers are not human beings. Look, you know, they, they, they live in the dirt. They're just <laughs> farmers. They can't send their kids to school. They don't deserve to live. When suddenly somebody who has no other reason to be there except for love of these people is there, your moribund sleeping awareness that these are human beings is reflected in those people. You embody the conscience – is an awkward kind of term – of the death squad people, which, which is asleep in them. So you're doing interpretation for them right there in the event. But now we go out and we give talks all over the country. And we patiently describe this is what happened and this is why it happened. The goal is that people will suddenly begin to understand. Uh, I made this – if you give me – I'll do this in 15 seconds. Uh, okay, we have people all over the country who are hanging up crosses representing the American soldiers who have died in Iraq. And I say, okay, okay, you want to do that? Do that. I'm not against it. But what if every time you had one of these things, you handed out a little flyer saying in 1948 the Iraqi people rose up nonviolently and they defeated the British and the petroleum companies. So why couldn't we go into Iraq, find the nonviolent activists, mostly in universities, <laughs> translate Gene Sharp and Michael Nagler into Arabic, especially the latter, and uh, <laughs> we could have done it that way. See, that would be interpretation because you're giving people a framework in which to interpret and evaluate. I guess that it should also be called, Andrea. To interpretation means understanding, appreciation, and evaluation of a nonviolent dynamic. Okay, great. So let's do a lot of interpretation between now and Thursday. I, uh, we are not going to have our guest speaker uh, from Colombia on Thursday. He's going to come right after spring break. <laughs>